Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. We're reading in Galatians, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. And we've come across a very interesting question at this point. What does Paul mean when he talks about being in bondage under the elements of the world? A little bit later, he seems to be implying that being under the law, in verse 4, being made, Jesus was made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, seems like almost an equation with being in bondage under the elements of the world. Is that what he's talking about? Is, is being in bondage to the elements of the world the same thing as being under the law? If so, does the law then equate with the elements of the world? That would be hard to conclude because in reality the, the law is the very antithesis of the elements of the world. It's a worldly thing to go out and, and beat up on some other person. The law forbids that. It's, it's an element of the world to commit adultery with another man's wife. The law forbids that. The law stands in stark opposition to the affairs, the elements, the, the things of this world. Why, when, what then is Paul talking about when he talks about being in bondage under the elements of the world? Well, when we look at it carefully, we have to understand that whenever one breaks one of God's commandments, he in a very real sense, comes under bondage to the law. You know, you break the law, they put the handcuffs on you. That's a very simple equation. Perhaps I could explain it best by going back to the statement in the law that if a man is a thief, if he is caught stealing, for example, if he has the, the animal or whatever it is he's stolen in his hand, he has to pay it back. If he has sold it off, he has a little different sort of a penalty. And there were specific formulas having to do with sheep and different kinds of things that if you stole them, there were definite restitution to be made. But if you had stolen and you were not able to make restitution, you were arrested, you were taken down to some public place, you were put on the auction block, and you were sold, yeah, sold, a slave to somebody. And the money from the sale was paid to the person you'd stolen from so that restitution could be made to him and whoever bought you for that period of time. And if you were a Hebrew, the maximum time was seven years. Whoever had bought you during that period of time got your work. He got it for a year or two years or three years or seven years or whatever it took to get that debt paid off. Seemed like a fairly fair system in a lot of ways and a man went free after it was all over. But certainly, when he broke the law, when he stole, he came in bondage to the law. The law required him to be made into a slave. I think this is the sort of thing Paul is talking about. The elements of the world, the, the, the affairs of this world, the things that this world does are in opposition to the laws of God. And when you're in bondage to these things, when you break the law of God, you're in bondage to the elements of the world, and in a very real sense, you are in bondage to the law of God. But that doesn't equate the law of God with the elements of the world. It's not the same thing. The law of God is good. It is spiritual. It is holy. It is just. The affairs of the world are corrupt. But you are in bondage to both when you commit sin. But when the fullness of time was come, verse 4, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, which is the familiar term for Father. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, verses 8 through 11 are of particular interest. I'll read them first, and then we'll comment on them. How be it then? When you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. 
What is he talking about here? Now, some commentators or some religionists believe that the biblical holy days, Passover, the days of unleavened bread, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Pentecost, were all done away. And that what was happening here, because the people who were causing the heresy in Galatia were Judaizers, was that they were teaching these people to keep the holy days. And Paul is upset because they're keeping the holy days, they say, that Paul says they shouldn't be observing days and months and times and years. But there's a problem with that. For indeed, if Paul is saying that uh, it's wrong to observe days and months and times and years, then he's got to include any days and months and times and years, not just the biblical days and months and times and years. Do you follow me? If it's wrong to observe the Passover then it certainly must be wrong to observe Easter. If it is wrong to observe the Feast of Tabernacles, why is it right to observe Lent? But you see, virtually every Christian church on the face of the earth observes days. Christmas is a day. Sunday is a day. Uh, Lent is a month. A little more than that, I guess. The different things that people observe, the days and months and times and years, I mean, they're, they're shot through every religion. So it would be a little bit difficult to see Paul as saying that they don't observe days and months and times and years at all. Well, what is he talking about here? Well, as I said, the overall context of the book of Galatians is about circumcision, about Judaizers, and so it's not illogical that someone could think immediately of the holy days. But if you look at the immediate context, you have a problem. Notice verse 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service to them which by nature are no gods. Hmm. That's interesting. These people weren't Jews. For you wouldn't make that comment about the Jews, that there was a time when they didn't know God. For the Jewish people all along had known God. They weren't doing service as a, a routine matter of their life. Well, of course, they had in Old Testament times, that, you know, they had observed Baal and Moloch and all the other gods. But after that last captivity they'd been through, they'd pretty well gotten that out of their system. And uh, at the time, when Jesus Christ was upon the earth and doing his ministry, the Jews had their act pretty well together as far as worshiping other gods was concerned. They had pretty well gotten any idea of observing that type of thing out of their systems entirely. And, of course, they were meticulous in observing the Sabbath. They felt that one of the reasons they'd gone into captivity was the breaking of the Sabbath. They were meticulous in that area huh, to a fault. They had some of the most ridiculous rules and regulations they had built up around the Sabbath that one could imagine. And it became a major source of conflict between them and Jesus. But these people in Galatia had not known God and had done service to those who by nature were no gods. In other words, they had been, prior to their conversion, rank pagans. That's simple enough to understand from verse 8. As a matter of interest, the expression, you did service, in verse 8, is the equivalent of you were in bondage in verse 3. In other words, the root words of service and bondage are the same. You were in bondage unto them, which by nature are no gods. And the equivalent, this use of the expression, which is lost in the King James Version, would be intended by Paul to tie verse 3 and verse 8 together, that the elements of the world and those who are by nature not gods are talking about basically the same thing. Verse 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather known of God, how turn you again? Now, what does that mean to you? What does the expression turn again mean? Basically, it means you're going back where you came from, not going someplace else. And indeed, the Greek word basically bears that out. How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Now, it would be difficult to say to these people that they were desiring to be again in bondage to the Jewish holy days, for they never had kept them prior to their knowledge of God. Prior to the time, they had been serving other gods. They had served Baal and Remphon and all the other various hosts of the heavens at this time. In fact, they had served the Greek gods, particularly by name. So, to say to them that they were turning again to the holy days... Well, that doesn't make any sense. They were turning back into what they had done before. Now let's consider another side of this story. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, he makes an interesting statement. 
He says, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, anyone who understands the history of the Bible, of Paul, the roots of Christianity, anyone knows that Paul is making a reference to the days of unle the Passover and the days of unleavened bread, right? It is simple. He actually specifically talks about Jesus being our Passover. He draws these allusions from the days of unleavened bread and talks about how we are to keep the days of unleavened bread, not merely in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. But he says, let's keep the feast. Now, however you look at this, whether you believe, as I as seems to be clearly borne out by the Scriptures and by other commentaries, that the Corinthian church was keeping the days of unleavened bread. But whether you believe that or not, Paul is speaking in useful terms of the days of unleavened bread and drawing the truth about what was the real meaning of the days of unleavened bread for the Corinthian church. Why would he write to the Corinthians using this, the first of the holy days? The Passover, you see, is the very first of all the holy days throughout the year. One of the most fundamental and perhaps the most important of all. The Passover, the first. Why would he speak of Christ, our Passover, and say, let us keep the feast to the Corinthians, and then refer to these days to the Galatians as weak and beggarly elements that hold us in bondage? Well, it just doesn't make any sense. And the truth is, he is talking about these people going back into something they had come out of before. Then he says, you observe days and months and times and years, but the word observe is inadequate here. The Greek word carries a much stronger meaning, saying you meticulously observe, you carefully observe, you are overly attentive to days and months and times and years. Now, viewed in the context of the book of Galatians, where Paul is talking about using the law as a means of salvation, using the law as a means of getting right with God, of perfecting your character, of somehow making you a better person, is a wrong use of the law. And so that consequently, as he comes along here and he says to these people, you are carefully observing days and months and times and years. Is he trying to tell them they shouldn't be observing days at all? Well, as I said before, the, the conflict with First Corinthians is evident if you thought that that was what he was doing. And churches, by and large, have always kept some sort of holy days. In fact, much of the Christian world today still observes a version of Passover. They keep it a different time and call it Easter, but that's still what it really amounts to in its origins. And, of course, there are the hot cross buns of the different kinds of special breads, which probably grow out of the days of unleavened bread. And, of course, the Catholic Church, the Church of England, and perhaps others as well, observe the Feast of Pentecost. So why would you be surprised that much of the Christian world, having had this kind of attention to holy days, why should we be surprised that one would feel that the remainder of the holy days should be kept as well? But really, what Paul is saying to the Galatians is, why is it that you're turning back into the pagan days you used to observe before? For he's not against the observance of days. It's a matter of which days and the reason for the observance of these days that are wrong in Paul's mind. It's a matter of observing pagan days, and it's a matter of trying to use religious ritual or ceremony for the purpose of trying to get yourself converted, saved, uh, uh, into God's kingdom, to make yourself more righteous before God, instead of submitting yourself to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can't use this scripture to say that Paul taught that no days were to be observed. It just won't hold up. Brethren, I beseech you, verse 12, be as I am for I am as you are. Let's, let's have a meeting of the minds. You haven't hurt me. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you didn't despise or reject. You received me as a messenger of God. You received me like I was Jesus Christ himself. He doesn't understand at this point why it is that the people are turning on him, because when he was there, they had a meeting of the minds. They were together, and even though he was going through a trial in the flesh, they didn't look down on him because of that. Where is the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. 
Most people look at that and suspect, then, that the real temptation, the trial, the affliction that Paul had endured in the flesh had to do with his eyesight. That he was nearly blind, apparently. How bad it was, uh, exactly the nature of it, it's impossible to know. Now he says, having loved each other this way, verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, they, now we do not know who they are. We just really aren't told. We can only derive from the book itself some sort of a feeling for what these people were saying. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Rather awkward in the, King, in, in the English King James Version, and rather awkward, in fact, in the Greek. But what Paul is saying, these people are really zealous after you, but not to any good purpose. They want you separated so that you might be on their side, a part of them, supporting them. Oh, it's good to be zealous, always in a good thing, and not only when I'm there. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I need to be present with you now. I, I need to be able to see you and, and to adjust my voice to your faces, to see and respond. For I stand in doubt of you. I don't know where you're coming from. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. What does Paul mean by the expression, under the law? It's really difficult, frankly. Uh, there have been many people who've tossed out ideas, such as under the penalty of the law, under a law system, under. but basically all the Greek says is under the law. You look at the word under in most of its usages in this context in the New Testament, and if you're going to add anything to it at all, you'd have to say basically what it means this way, is to be under the power of something, to be under the power of the law. Now, even that requires some interpretation, doesn't it? For you could say if you're under the power of the law, that means you're under the control of the law, that you are required to obey the law. And then not to be under the law would be not to be required to obey the law. That's the line of reasoning that some people take. But the context of Galatians would seem more to say that being under the power of the law mean, or being in bondage to the law essentially has to do with having broken the law and being handcuffed. In other words, being bound by the law because you have transgressed it. For there is nothing in the law that would condemn a man for telling the truth. There is nothing in the law that would condemn a man for being faithful to his own wife. There is nothing in the law that's bad about honoring your father and your mother. There's no yoke of bondage here. Well, then a person might suggest, yes, but there's a yoke of bondage in all of the sacrifices and the rituals and the ceremonies and the washings. People couldn't do all those things. Oh? Does your local butcher feel like he's under a yoke of bondage? Or does he feel he's got one of the greatest money-making opportunities that ever came his way? Does he feel under yoke of bondage because he has to kill animals and, and cut up animals? And uh, Of course not. Of course not. But don't we realize that's all the priests did? Was to kill animals, sprinkle their blood? It was no great yoke of bondage. It was their job. They were paid for it. And, indeed, they were very well paid for what they did. They would have been, based upon any, any kind of a delineation of money in Israel of old, among the wealthiest of that society. So they were not under any yoke of bondage. It was a great blessing to them to be able to serve God in the temple and do sacrifices. And, of course, most of the children of Israel lived out their life and never offered an animal sacrifice. For, you see, you could never offer one anywhere except at the temple. You couldn't offer a sacrifice up in Galilee. It was not permitted by law. You had to go to Jerusalem. And many of them were too poor to go and may have lived and died and never gone down there and yet served God in their own way where they were and had a relationship with God. You didn't have to offer sacrifices in Old Testament time to have a relationship with God. So merely being required to obey the law was no yoke of bondage, but it certainly was a yoke of bondage when you broke it. Because when you broke it, then specific penalties were attached to the law, things that had to be done. In some cases, the penalty was death. So, Paul comes back and says, now I want you to talk, tell me this. You people who desire to be under the law. Now, what do you mean under the law? Basically, under the power of the law. You people who want to be in the position to where you are depending on the law. For what? 
for salvation, for making you right with God. Now, we'd have to go back to the book of Romans and read Paul's comments when he talks about now. Uh, do we make void the law because we are not under the law but under grace? Oh, God forbid, we establish the law. The law isn't done away because you and I are not under it anymore. That's a simple understanding. The law is still in effect, and if you break the law, you will come under the law again. Don't we understand that if we commit adultery as Christians, we come back under the law unless we repent and accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Certainly. Certainly we do. So it's possible for a human being in the 20th century to come under the law. Tell me, you that want to be under the law, you who want to rely on the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now this is a reference to a story of Abraham and Sarah, and how that God had made a promise to them that Abraham would have a son, and that certain things were going to take place. Uh, the son was going to inherit certain things. Time passed, and no son was born. Abraham and Sarah became somewhat concerned, and they thought, how is this going to happen? All I've got now is a servant that was born in my house, and he's going to wind up being my heir, and they panicked. And Sarah came to Abraham and said, here, take my handmaid, take Hagar, and you go in unto her and raise up children, because we have got to have this child. So he had two sons. One was born by a bondmaid, that is, for the, by, from the servant girl. But then in the process of time, God answered his promise. He said, no, I, this, this Ishmael is not going to be your heir. Isaac is going to be your heir. You're going to have a son by your legitimate wife, not by your concubine. And so Sarah conceived and bore a son. So one by a bondmaid, one by a free woman. But it goes on in verse 23 to say, he who was born of the bondwoman, that's Ishmael, was born after the flesh. Now, what does that mean? Well, essentially it means that he was the result of Abraham and Sarah, two fleshly human beings, trying to work out the problem their own way. That's all. They decided they had to do something, that God's promise had not been fulfilled this way, and maybe then God expects us to do this, that, or the other thing, and they had gotten busy, and they had solved the problem their way. So the son that was born was the result of a human decision. He was born of the flesh. But he that was of the free woman was by promise. For God had promised that Sarah would have a son. Not, not the maid, but the wife. And here she was, long past menopause, past the age of bearing children. And she laughed when God said she was going to have a child. And I guess she laughed again when she had the child. So these two sons are born. And Paul draws this out to point out that salvation is a matter of the promise of God. The promise of God to send his son the promise of God that his son would die for our sins, the promise of God that we should be heirs of the world. These were promises. These weren't things that we could earn. These aren't things that we can work out. These aren't things we can bring to pass. And so he's trying to point out the difference between two approaches. Now, he says, which things are an allegory? And this allegory, which he's talking about here, has generated more discussion, and, and it seems to be hard, so hard for people to understand. And with good reason, actually, because for some strange reason, Paul does not complete the allegory. He says, these things are an allegory, verse 24. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all, or is written, and so forth. Do you notice something? He says, these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, and then he never discusses the other one, never mentions it. And this is one of the reasons why people have read through here and become confused and have such a hard time following this allegory, that Paul, uh, at least apparently, does not even finish his allegory. It is a logical assumption uh, for a, a 20th century Christian, say, when he reads, these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai to fill in, and the other one is the New Covenant. The only problem is that that doesn't say that here. And there is only one other covenant that Paul talks about in the book of Galatians. He has had, at this point, two covenants under discussion. The one 
from Mount Sinai. That was the covenant that was made when Israel came out of Egypt, the establishment, really a renewal of the covenant with Abraham, that is the national covenant with Abraham. The establishment of a theocracy, if you were, a literal human government. So we have that covenant that is discussed here. And in chapter 3, he discusses the covenant that was made with Abraham. The covenant that could not be disannulled by the law or by the covenant that came after it. The covenant that follows all the way through to Christians, to Gentile Christians, and, and to the point that Paul says in chapter 3, verse 29, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises, the promises of that original covenant. So the covenants, the two covenants he's talking about, are the covenant of Mount Sinai, which has to do with works of the flesh and things that human beings do. The other covenant was the covenant that was originally made in Abraham that was the promise of grace, that in his seed would all nations be blessed. And that seed was singular, and that seed was Christ. All right, let's take a look at the allegory again and see what it is that it's saying. These are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which genders or brings forth children to bondage, which is Agar. Yeah, it does, really. Because the theocracy had no way of creating life. The law was not given which could forgive sin. The law was never, in a sta never established which could render a person righteous before God. The law was designed to tell man what sin is. Not to keep him from doing it, because there's no way that you could keep man from doing it. The law defines sin. And so, when that old covenant was made at Mount Sinai, and the law was given to these people, it brought them into bondage, because they were predetermined, not by God making them do it, but because of human weakness to break it, which they did. And when they broke it, they came into bondage. Not that the law was bad, not that it wasn't something somebody should do, not that it wasn't given whereby man should live, but because man breaks it, they come into bondage. And so, Jerusalem, which was sitting there at that time, was very much in bondage. It was an occupied city. This Agar, verse 25, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. In bondage because of the transgression of God's law and sadly because of the rejection of their Savior. Okay, this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, you barren that bear not. Break forth and cry, you that travail not. For the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband. What are we talking about here? Well, Israel of old, of course, was a nation. And they grew and they flourished before they went into captivity. But what this seems to be saying is that in the final fulfillment of the covenant, the children of Sarah will be far more numerous. Who are the children of Sarah, though? They are all those who come under the covenant of grace, the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And indeed, the primary persecution on the church up until this time had been Jewish. It was the Jews. It was those people who went about trying to establish their own righteousness by the works of the law, which could never be done, for the law was never written that could make a man righteous. So it goes on to say, Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. You are not going to get into the kingdom of God by your own works, no matter what they are. Only by the works, the sacrifice, the intervention of Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, we are children of the free. Chapter 5, in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and don't become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Ah, beautiful statement. Don't get yourself back into that kind of a situation. Don't get yourself involved in legalism or the rudiments of the world or whatever it may be that puts you into bondage. Well, the truth is that the transgression of the law puts man into bondage as well. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, 
that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, what's he saying by that? Does mean that Christ cannot profit a Jew? Well, hardly. Paul himself was circumcised. Had Christ profited him? He circumcised Timothy himself. Did that block Timothy from Christ? For indeed, if we're going to throw proof texts around and just take verses out of context, then you'd have to have, you could actually argue from this verse that no circumcised person could ever be saved. But that's not what Paul's talking about. You have to remember the context of the book. He's talking about the things that people do themselves in order to try to justify themselves before God. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you are circumcised in order to be justified, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Don't just think circumcision does it. You've got an obligation to keep the whole law. You can be circumcised and break another law, and you're a dead man. Circumcision, my brethren, doesn't get it done. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. What does that say? If you are trying to rely on the law for your justification, you're wasting your time being a Christian. Christ isn't going to help you. You're going about trying to establish your own righteousness by works of law instead of submitting yourself to the righteousness of Christ. Do we then make void the law, Paul asks the Romans, because we are justified by grace and not by the law? Oh, God forbid. We establish the law. We put the law right where it belongs as a, an expression of the will of God, as an expression of the law of God, as a revelation to man of what is good and what is evil. That's all. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. So you don't get anything by being circumcised. But then on the other hand, you don't get anything by being uncircumcised either. For the things of the flesh don't, don't get you anywhere with God. <laughs> you can cut your ear off. You can, you can do anything you want to do. You can have skin grafts. You can name it. These are of the flesh. They have to do with things that you can do. And indeed, when you have transgressed the law of God and you are under the penalty of death, there is nothing that you can do. There is no law you can keep. There is no sacrifice you can offer. There is no uh, ceremony you can go through to do penance for yourself. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. You started so well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion does not come from him that calls you. Remember, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. It doesn't take an awful lot of, of error to, to lead people astray. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, that the person that's causing this trouble here shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. I don't know what he means by that. Does he mean that he doesn't know who it is? Or does he mean that the person is some fairly important person, but he's going to bear his punishment no matter how important that he is? And I, brethren, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I suffering persecution? If I'm preaching persecution, then the stumbling block of the cross will cease. Now, that really helps you to focus in on where some of this problem is coming from. That the persecution and the opposition was coming from people who believed in, in circumcision, and they were alleging that Paul was preaching circumcision, that he ought to do it. But Paul says, look, if I was preaching circumcision, I wouldn't be having anywhere near the troubles that I'm having now because the reason I'm getting the troubles is from Jews who believe I should be teaching you to circumcise your children, you Gentiles. I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. But don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Huh, another way of saying it. He does this so many times. He tries to help us to understand the difficult equation. On the one hand, there is nothing that you can do in the law or otherwise that can justify you before God. But on the other hand, because you are free, that doesn't mean you have the right to go out and, and violate the law. He goes on to say, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But, of course, Paul also knows the other side of that equation is 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your strength. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed of one another. Paul doesn't mean that you have no obligation to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength just because he doesn't mention it here. What he is doing when he quotes that part of the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is addressing himself to a group of people who were biting and devouring one another and calling out that particular part of the law which applied to them specially at this moment in time. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. You're not under the penalty of the law. But does that mean you can break the law? Listen to what he says. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Now, what makes adultery wrong? If the law is done away with? Well, I, I, what can you say? Adultery is wrong because God said it was wrong. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, well, that means then that just because you are not under the law, that that doesn't free you to do as you please. Yeah, I, I guess we'd have to conclude that. Now, he's only addressing at this point of time how to love your fellow man. But bear in mind that there are laws that specify how to love God and how to worship God. Can we worship God any way we please? Any more than we can love our fellow man any way we please? But he goes on to say, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Oh, there's no law against these things, but there is a law against the others. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and with the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... You which are spiritual will restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Man, that's potent. If a man be overtaken in a fault, now we all know people have been overtaken in faults, don't we? Um, if you're a wife, you are probably have, I can find several faults in your husband between now and the time the sun goes down next time. There's no real problem with finding fault in other people. He goes on then to say, you which are spiritual, restore such an one. There must be a lot of spiritual people around. Because there never seems to be any shortage of someone who is willing to try to restore you from the error of your ways, is there? I mean, there's people who know you are very quick to point out or to steer or to guide or to try to put your feet back in the right paths. Jesus said, if you see a moat in your brother's eye, and so tempting to try to get it out for him. But he said, you really need to consider that beam in your own eye first and get that out. And then, then you can consider that moat that's in your brother's eyes. Here Paul says, you who are spiritual, and I don't know, I guess a person would have to ask himself every day of his life in the morning, am I really qualified to start trying to restore someone who is overtaken in a fault? He not only to, does, says that, but then he goes on with a caution to those who are spiritual to be sure and do it in a spirit of meekness. You know, it is so much easier when a person comes to you and says, you know, I may be wrong, and I, I, you know, I, there are a lot of things I don't understand, and I know I really don't have much, you know, I'm, I have my own mistakes, and I have trouble getting my own life in order, and I'm reluctant to say anything about it, and, uh, but I just thought I'd mention it for what it's worth. It's hard to get mad at a person who comes to you in that kind of a spirit and that kind of an attitude and says, I, I just wanted to let you know that I, I didn't understand what you said yesterday and I, I thought maybe you might want to reconsider. It's not too difficult when someone really is careful to listen to them and to respond and to be restored. 
And we really need to think before we start trying to straighten somebody else that there is a great temptation to vanity and to ego that's connected with it. Verse 2, bear you one another's burdens, help one another, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Actually, this is a different word from the word above, which says, let's bear one another's burdens. You get the impression you've got a conflict right there, but it's a different Greek word. It means every man shall bear his own responsibility. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. What does that mean? Well, it's a, it's very simple, really. It means pay your minister well. He said, let him that is taught in the word communicate. The word means essentially to give to him that does the teaching in all good things. In other words, return back to him. Don't just take, but restore or give to another person, and particularly to the teachers. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, that's a little bit frightening on the one side, but it's tremendously encouraging on the other. Uh, you'll hear a lot of sermons from time to time from people who will talk about whatever you sow, you shall also reap in stentorian thundering terms. They will tell you what a danger it is to ro sow to the flesh. And indeed, we ought to be frightened a little bit by that, and it ought to sober us. But the other side of the equation is beautiful. It's an absolute ironclad guarantee that if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In other words, give attention to the spiritual side of your life if you do. It will bear fruit. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Now, probably the cause of the loss of more Christians than anything else is the fact that they try, and they try, and they keep on trying. And finally there comes a day when they just get tired of trying. Don't become weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you just don't give up. Keep on trying. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, it's justified for us to give special attention to our own brothers in the church. We're supposed to do good to all men. That's true. But it is right and proper for us to, you know, what's the saying, charity begins at home? I think that's fair enough. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand? The implication is, is that he's writing actually with large letters. He doesn't see very well, and so when he writes with his own hand, he has to write with very large letters. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now that verse is interesting, because if, indeed, the people who are causing the trouble in Galatians are, are Jews, Jewish Christians who are advocating circumcision, the biblical record seems to indicate that most of those people who were of Jewish origin who advocated and preached circumcision with a great deal of zeal did so out of conviction. These people were not preaching circumcision out of conviction, interestingly enough. They were preaching circumcision, and he said, mainly to avoid persecution. Their only re main reason for doing it. For the fact is, they are not keeping the law. They themselves, who are being circumcised, are not keeping the law. The whole point of this is not circumcision. They have drung, dragged a, a giant red herring across your trail. Oh, I've been through this so many times in the ministry. That whenever someone comes along with a doctrine, an idea, some far-out subject, some baby that they've generated they want to convey to other people, it's usually not the real issue. The real issue probably lies somewhere else, and Paul says here it lies somewhere else. They're making a big issue, he says, out of the law, but that's not the point. They want to do this not because they keep the law, but because they want to have control of you. They want to be able to glory in your flesh. They, it's an ego trip on their parts, what he's saying. All this big deal has nothing to do with a true zeal for obedience to God. It has to do with self-glorification. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, 
neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That's what counts. A new creation. That you, having gone into the waters of baptism and come up out of the waters of baptism, having been begotten of the Spirit of God, are a new creature in God. Not a new creature who can do as he pleases. Not a new, new creature who can run roughshod all over the law of God. Not a new creature who can stampede across the feelings of other people. Not a new creature who can go charging off trying to teach other people obedience to the law when he himself doesn't keep it. Just a new creature in Christ and the Spirit of God. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Not just Israel the Israel of God, which Paul understood to be that body of converted, baptized believers. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He was a little weary, frankly, of criticism. And there's always somebody standing ready to call you to question about the things that you've done. Even this man, yeah, even this man, who wherever he went, whenever he took his shirt off, someone could look at his back and see the marks that were put on his back because of his service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Several times he received the 40 stripes save one of the Jews. He was beaten beyond that measure by the Romans on several occasions. His body must have been marked something terrible. He says, I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting weary of this constant criticism. I'm getting weary of this questioning of my motives. Brethren, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Powerful words to conclude his epistle. And finally, he says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.